Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say, welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study. Are you ready to get back in our Father's Word? Book of Acts. Why the Book of Acts? Because that's the way you're supposed to act if you're a Christian. That's the way the church is supposed to act if you wish to be successful. Many churches are not successful because they don't teach God's Word chapter by chapter and verse by verse, but they have men that sound off for an hour. You know, usually about kin folks and what have you, rather than teaching God's Word. Now, this 15th chapter that we're in is a chapter, if I were to title it, it would be Dissension. Because we, we have a lot of dissension in as much as the ministry has just opened up whereby Gentiles are welcome. Gentiles can find salvation through the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and the dissension came about from Jerusalem as to how, many, how much and what of the old Mosaic law that the Gentiles would have to fulfill. And it came to the point that as long as they did not practice idolatry, that means to worship something other than God, fornication, or to kill something or eat something in the blood, meaning to obey the health laws. In other words, when, when an animal that is proper is not a scavenger, but is healthy food, then be sure and bleed it because that putrefies the flesh and makes it unedible. That they should obey those rules and other than that they didn't have to be circumcised in as much as now because Christ had shed his blood on the cross meaning the ordinances of blood sacrifice were done away with. He fulfilled that. He didn't change the law. And you got to know the difference between law, ordinances, and statutes. Okay. Because the blood sacrifice done away with circumcision now is of the heart and it applies to both men and women. Okay. The circumcision is still okay for health reasons if one feels it's necessary, but it has nothing whatsoever to do with serving God. So, having said that, uh, let's pick it up again with the dissension having been underway. Chapter 15, verse 21, and it reads with that word of wisdom from our Father. For Moses of old time hath in every city them that preach him being read in the synagogues every Sabbath day. That law was read, and no problem. 22, then pleased it the apostles and elders with the whole church to send chosen men of their own company to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas, namely Judas surnamed uh, Barsabbas, and Silas, Silas meaning Woody, chief men among the brethren. And Barsabbas Sabbath means the son of rest, like Sabbath means the day of rest. This is Bar, his son, son of rest, okay, in, in the Hebrew tongue. Barnabas, don't forget, was a citizen of Cyprus. So he, he liked to go there and he liked to teach there because he was familiar with the language and the people that would be there, 23. And they wrote letters by them after this manner. The apostles and elders and brethren send greetings unto the brethren which are of the Gentiles in Antioch and Syria and Cilicia. We, we um, and you know, until Peter was approached by Almighty God on the roof that day with the unclean animals being lowered down. And then he says, I'm not talking about animals. I'm talking about man. Don't you call Gentiles unclean or uncommon, I should say, <clears throat> but allow them to come into the church. Verse 24, for as much as we have heard that certain which went out from us have troubled you with words, subverting your soul, saying you must be circumcised and keep the law to whom we gave no such commandment. We didn't send them. They're out there on their own. Now, unfortunately for people that are uneducated in the manuscripts, this gets a little confusing because they say, well, they're saying, they're saying it's all law. Well, it's not so. Circumcision wasn't of the law. It was an ordinance. And a blood ordinance to boot, okay? And it is sacrilegious for a Christian to, to sacrifice or feel anything must be done by blood because Christ's blood fulfilled for one and all times. But the law itself, let's take the law of gravity. 
if you climb a, a tall ladder and jump off, what happens? You're going to fall to the ground. Why? God's law is still very much in effect. Um, thou shall not steal. If you steal, what's going to happen? You're going to be arrested. You're going to be found out. Sooner or later, you're a crook. Okay? You're breaking the law. So the law is still very much in existence. But that ordinance concerning days, blood, and so forth, nailed to the cross. All right? So don't, don't get caught up in legalism uh, by ignorance. Okay, verse 25. It seemed good unto us being assembled with one accord to send chosen men unto you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul. You know, we, we want to send men that know what we're talking about, that we have educated, that know what the truth is. We want them to share that with you Gentiles. Verse 26. Men that have hazarded their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay. In other words, uh, Paul himself had been a little guilty of persecuting the church before his conversion. 27. We have sent, therefore, Judas and Silas, who shall also tell you the same things by mouth. In other words, they will orally, you won't have to just read the letter, they're going to come there to preach orally. Okay. Uh, 28. For it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things. And no, no greater, don't make the law a burden. Okay. Uh, that uh, to the point you couldn't live by it. Why? Because Christ brought in the law of freedom, which is to say forgiveness, so that when you repent. Now, again, I want to remind you, who did it say approved of this? The Holy Spirit. Don't ever man take credit for what the Holy Spirit does or you'll end up in trouble. Okay. They did these things in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, not their name. They didn't build some church and call it the Church of Silas, right here, the Church of Paul. No, it's the Lord's Church. Okay. Don't ever take credit for what God does, or, or He will take from you your gifts for the time being. Um, and uh, verse 29, to continue. That ye abstain from meats offered to idols and from blood, and from things strangled, and from fornication, from which if ye you keep yourselves, ye you shall do well, fare you well. That's goodbye, end of letter. Now, um, and again, um, they added to this because it's for a weak person to abstain from meat offered to idols. Now, uh, this is, if there is a weak person that does not understand, idols are nothing. They're a stick of wood, a chunk of rock, that don't amount to a hill of beans. And, and some heathen can dedicate it to, to, to this idol or that idol. If it's a nice big ribeye steak, you know, and you're found sound in the truth, you know there's nothing wrong with it. You can eat it, but don't ever do it in front of a weak person that wouldn't understand. Okay? Uh, not know that an idol was nothing. It's nothing to a Christian, a true Christian. Verse 30. So when they were, understand I said clean food now, not in scavenger. No scavengers for Christians. Verse 30. So when they were dismissed, they came to Antioch. And when they had gathered the multitude, that's to say of Christians, together, they delivered uh, the epistle. They, they let the truth, the message, be covered. 31. Which when they, when they had read, they rejoiced for the consolation. That's to say for the, um, for the teaching and for, for the exhortation. Okay. So that they could understand. You know, you might think this is rather strange, but see, they had been excluded basically up to this time by who? By the muckety ducks at Jerusalem. Okay. And now, with God Himself opening uh, the very door, and even at Christ's crucifixion, the temple, the Holy of Holies, the veil being rent from top to bottom, 
saying, come on in. You don't need some religious man, some holy Joe, to allow you into the holy of holies. God has already made it possible. Verse 32, and Judas and Silas, being prophets also themselves, exhorted the brethren with many words and confirmed them by, by mouth and by teaching, confirmed them. Now, prophets here are prophets that teach the word of God. Okay, that's what a, pro a prophet also is a teacher. All prophets are teachers, but not all teachers are prophets. But all teachers should teach the prophets. That's to say, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Daniel, and so forth. And all teachers should be educated or have been taught of the Holy Spirit to the point, if they have the gift of God to teach, that they are able to teach adequately and handle whatever question might come along concerning the Scripture, concerning God's Word. So um, they are, uh, the church is growing as every church should. It's, it's a real simple thing to cause a church to grow. All you got to do is teach God's Word instead of man's traditions. Then God, through the Holy Spirit, sees to the growth. It's going to happen. Okay, verse 33. And after they had tarried their space, they were let go in peace from the brethren unto the apostles. They hardly wanted them to go because they wanted to hear the word of God. Can you imagine that? They were rejoicing in it. 34. Notwithstanding, it pleased Silas to abide there still. They, they, they just hung on to him. Silas being old Woody. And old Woody just hung around. All right. 35. Paul also and Barnabas continued in Antioch teaching and preaching the word of the Lord with many others also. Now, you're going to find why I call this a chapter of dissension because prior it was certain uh, legalist, so-called men of God, that objected to the Gentiles saying they're going to have to line up here but now we're going to have a little trouble among the apostles themselves. That's the way the word grows sometimes. You have to understand the Holy Spirit and the operation thereof. Verse 36. And some days after Paul said unto Barnabas, Let us go again and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they do. Let's go check up on them. Let's go see what did we preach to them. Not the sayings of Paul and not the sayings of Barnabas, but the word of God. Verse 37. And Barnabas determined to take with them John, whose surname was Mark. Little old Mark John. Let's, let's take him along with us. Now, you got to remember what happened here. Back when the going kind of got a little rough, Mark John was with them. And all of a sudden, Mark John decided he didn't want any more of this. I'm going back to Jerusalem. And back to Jerusalem, he went. In other words, he wasn't with Paul and Barnabas when they taught most of this rough country, you might say. So a little Mark John, uh, Paul kind of feels a little, it was special to him that they go and rededicate to check up to see what's happening in these churches that he and Barnabas established, not Mark John. Okay. Now, next verse, please. Verse 38. But Paul thought not good to take him with them who departed from them from Pamphylia, that's to say of every tribe, and went not with them to the work. He, he didn't go out there and work where they're going. And, and Paul just kind of doesn't see fit to take him along on this ride. Verse 39. And the contention, here it comes, the contention was so sharp between them that they departed asunder one from the other, and so Barnabas took Mark and sailed unto Cyprus. And of course, that was his home. And this is kind of, Barnabas would feel very comfortable in Cyprus because it was his home. That's where his kinfolk were. That's where he grew up at. And he was quite comfortable there. And naturally, Paul, why well, you're going to find Silas kind of hooking up with Paul here because... Uh, ultimately, remember the great letter of, to the Thessalonians? 
there at Thessalonica that it was Paul and Silas that uh, will team up there and bring the word of God. And so it is. God, do you, do you give credit here? Is it just that men can't get along? No, I, I, I really believe that God moves his election. Okay. I think God had every reason to split them up now. These are two elders. Split them up and let them get a buddy and let's send them out two witnesses in each direction um, and let the church grow. Verse 40. And Paul chose Silas. There you got it and departed, being recommended by the brethren unto the grace of God. In other words, they, were, they prayed about it, they were anointed, and the Holy Spirit, uh, through the grace of God, allowed them to go on their way. 41, and he went through Syria and Cilicia, confirming the churches, checking up on them. I mean, they were his uh, spiritual children, so to speak, his converts. And how he loved them. Paul Paul loved the people. Uh, Paul never having other than his mother and grandmother, and no doubt when he was very young, maybe his father. That's all the family he ever really had other than uh, when he studied and, and uh, partnered up with uh, certain helpers. Uh, so therefore, he made it up by loving the people in the church. He's about to pick up a staunch follower here. Chapter 16, verse 1. Then came he to Derby and Lystra, Lystra, I should say, and behold, a certain disciple was there named Timotheus, or we say Timothy, okay, the son of a certain woman, which was a Jewish and believed, but his father was a Greek. His father was a Hellenist, okay. And, uh, and he was uh, known as uh, an Ish. Okay, so, uh, so this, this means that uh, Timothy has not been circumcised. And uh, in Galatians 2, what is it, 8, they spied him out when he first went there. Verse 2, which was well reported of by the brethren that were at Lystria, Lystra and Iconium. So, highly spoken of. Timothy was really, I mean, he was hungry. He was hungry for the truth. And he loved the Lord uh, Jesus Christ and our Heavenly Father. Verse 3. Him would Paul have to go forth with him and took and circumcised him because of the Jews which were in those quarters for they knew all that his father, they knew all that his father was a Greek. In other words, um, According to the old law, he was part uh, Hebrew, and therefore he should be circumcised by the old law. And Paul said, you know, and I suppose, you know, sometimes you have to, Paul wants to teach the word, and he doesn't want legalism to sidetrack. So, though it was not necessary for, for Timothy to be circumcised, it just, uh, in as much as in Galatians uh, chapter 2, verse 8, uh, um, that they would spy, I mean, they, these crooks actually slipped into the, into the restroom and spied out that Timothy hadn't been circumcised. So when you're dealing with people like that, naturally your brethren crept in unaware, so it is written, then it was better to get it out of the way and have it done with. Um, and I suppose we could say too, in as much as his mother was um, of a, uh, of one of the tribes of Judah, no doubt. And again, I, I want you to know, I want you to bear in mind, just because occasionally it will say that the Jews did this or that, Eudas in the Greek tongue means a resident of the land of Judea or a child of Judah. Okay. So um, we had a lot of Kenites that moved into Jerusalem and claimed to be of our brother Judah and caused him much consternation doing their father's work. Okay, let's go with the next verse, verse 4. And as they went through the cities, they delivered them the decrees for to keep that were ordained of the apostles and elders which were at Jerusalem. They, uh, that in chapter 15, it was decided upon, that word was passed down. And don't eat in the blood, don't uh, worship idols, and so forth. Five. And so were the churches established in the faith, 
and increased in number daily. Do you know something? That's the way it always is when you teach God's Word chapter by chapter and verse by verse with clarity, okay, with understanding. You can't help growing. You'll never be hard up for students. Verse 6. And when they had gone throughout uh, Pergia um, and the region of Galatia and were forbidden of the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia, wouldn't let them go to the Orient. Wasn't time. So you want to know when God sends, God didn't send him to the Orient. Didn't give him permission to go to the Orient. And the Holy Spirit forbid him from going there. Verse 7. After they were come to Mysia, and they essayed to go into Bithyra, but the Spirit suffered them not. Again, blocked them right there. No, you can't go into the Orient. And they passed by Mysia, came down to Taurus. This is the old Trojan town, all right? Um, uh, the uh, main, the, pl the plain of Troy, okay? Verse 9, And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. There stood a man of Macedonia and prayed him, saying, Come over into Macedonia and help us. Now, it is believed by most that uh, Paul was showing Luke in this vision. And Luke will begin to be the scribe because there will, this word we will begin to happen. Along with Paul and Silas, you'll have this we. We is Luke, Paul, and Silas. Because it's really quite easy for a scholar to follow this because the terms, in as much as Luke was a medical doctor, uh, immediately um, we begin to see medical terms slip up in the manuscripts here. Or, or worked into the manuscript for more clarity. And uh, we, you can recognize the pen of Luke a mile away. Okay, Here it comes right here, 10. And after he had seen the vision, immediately we, that's Luke, okay, endeavored to go into Macedonia, assuredly gathering that the Lord had called us for to preach the gospel unto them. Who were they following? Their own will, their own way? No, the Lord. Okay. The, through the Holy Spirit. Verse 11. Therefore, loosing from Tor Taurus, we came with a straight course to um, Samothyrica. Uh, this is a, this means um, it's an island in the Mediterranean, kind of called the high ground. And the next day to Neapolis, uh, a, a new city there. Samotrachia was, um, uh, again, one of the coast towns. Verse 12. And from thence to Philippia, which um, is the chief city of, the, of that part of Macedonia, and a colony. And we were in that city abiding several days. Had a lot of work to do there. Okay. Verse 13. And on the Sabbath, we went out of the city by a riverside where prayer was wont to be made. And we sat down and spake unto the women which resorted to them. So we got a group of women having a prayer session here. Verse 14, And a certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple, of the city of Thyatira, which worshipped God. She worshipped who? She worshipped God. Heard us, whose heart the Lord opened, that she attended unto the things which were spoken of Paul. And... Um, this, this uh, particular place, uh, this, this reminds you of another place where a woman worked with purple. What is the color of purple? It's royalty, okay? And there was a shell fish in this area called the murex, which this purple dye came from. 
And she was a very successful businesswoman there. And of course, sometimes that gets like it did Hagar, a woman of bad reputation, is to lodge uh, merchants and um, sell flax, where she hid spies under the flax uh, at one time. 15. And when she was baptized in her household, she besought us, saying, If ye have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and abide there. And she constrained us. She, she, uh, it pleased them. Uh, now, did she say, if you find me pleasing to yourselves? No, she said, to the Lord. Okay. And so we have a genuine Christian, a servant of God, and a very successful businesswoman. Verse 16. And it came to pass, as we went to prayer, a certain damsel possessed with a spirit of divination met us, which brought her masters much gain by soothsaying. She was a fortune teller deluxe. I mean, she could get it on, okay? Um, but this word divination is puthon, puthon. Uh, in, in the Greek tongue. And you know what it means? A python. Serpent. Of the serpent. I mean, it, it was of the worst kind. 17. The same followed Paul and us and cried, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, which show unto us the way of salvation. And you know what? Every word of that is true. True right to the core. And this is what, you know, uh, unfortunately, many Christians are a little bit, just a little bit on the biblically illiterate side. They think they know God's word, but they, you know something? When Satan tempted Christ in Matthew chapter 4, what did he use? He quoted scripture. Quoted scripture a lot better than most Christians can. And in other words, he keeps it 100% correct up until the last little end, and then he gives it a little tweak that makes it all a lie. So she's, she's buttering them up. That's Satan's M.O. Make you feel good. Oh, you are the best. You're a dandy. Better be careful when that happens, my friend. Verse 18. And this did she many days. But Paul, being grieved, turned and said to the spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out the same hour. I mean, all this ability she had to see into the past and so forth. You know, when one is possessed, uh, they, may have been, they may have possessed a person 400 years ago in Spain. Sure, they can tell you just exactly what happened in Spain at that time and so forth. Why? It's a demon. Evil spirit, better said. And, uh, and likes nothing better than to possess. But this spirit is what was making these dudes all this money. Okay. I mean, this is their cash thing going here. Paul has already messed it up. Okay. I mean, he has ruined it first class for them. Because this damsel is free now. Okay. She's not going to be able to tell fortunes anymore. And I don't want to come down on so-called fortune tellers or anything of that nature, but I'm talking about evil possessions. 19. And, I mean, if you want to spend five bucks a minute to have somebody tell your, uh, read your palm, well, hey, you know, that's, that's okay. If you got the money, hey, they got the time, all right? But you can learn a lot more from God's scripture than you ever will in that way. But anyway, be that as it may. 19. And when her masters saw that the hope of their gains was gone, I mean, nipped in the bud, they caught Paul and Silas and drew them into the marketplace uh, unto the rulers. I mean, they, we want to be rid of these dudes. They'd messed up our playhouse, come in here with too much common sense. Verse 20, and brought them to the magistrate saying, these men being Jews do exceedingly trouble our city. Now, in the first place, Paul wasn't a Jew. Okay. Paul was a Benjamite. He was of the tribe of Benjamin, of the seed of Abraham. Romans chapter 11 will document it for you. He was of a Judean at one time because he lived in Judea. 
Just like if I live in Arkansas and I'm an Arkansan or an Arky as some people would like to call us, be that as it may. You have geographical titles and you have um, uh, heritage titles. And, uh, Paul's heritage was, as you can read in verse 1 of chapter 11, Romans, a Benjamite. Okay? But, so, but they know they're from Judea, so they nail them with it, and here we go. So they're, they're causing all kinds of trouble. Why? They ruined their cash uh, dividends here. Okay, 21. And teach customs which are not lawful for us to receive, neither to observe, being Romans. We, be, we got to serve Roman law. We only have one God, Caesar to always take an advantage of this. They sure didn't have much trouble with who, what law they served when they, they had their soothsayer, huh? 22. And the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates ran off their clothes and commanded to beat them. 23. And when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison charging the jailer to keep them safely. Now, they don't know how much trouble they're in. They don't know. I mean, these, these uh, sorcerers turn them in and say they're Judeans. What they don't know, Paul's dad, his earthly father, is a Roman. And they have beaten a Roman citizen without even a trial, and they are in deep, deep trouble. Uh, Paul will kind of let this slip up on them, and he'll bring it to them gently here in the next lecture. Don't you miss it. All right, bless your heart. You listen a moment, won't you please? The Mark of the Beast 